Murphy, Digital Marketing Coordinator for CardioTabs. And thank you for attending Dietary Tips to help reduce your risk of developing cancer with registered dietitian and cancer survivor, Joan O'Keefe. Don't forget to check out our blog, From the Heart, which provides tips on living a healthier lifestyle from a cardiologist and dietitian. You may find that at cardionutrition.wordpress.com. Also, see our nutrition video series answering commonly asked health and nutrition questions at youtube.com backslash cardiotabs or go to youtube.com and type cardiotab in the search box. For this presentation, our presenter is Joan O'Keefe. For those of you who are not familiar with Mrs. O'Keefe, she's a registered dietitian who attended San Diego State University where she received her BA in food and nutrition. She then received her RD after practicing as a dietary intern at the Mayo Clinic. At age 27, six months pregnant with her first child, Joan was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. Joan's focus on nutrition and fitness was intensified by this experience. She also felt firsthand the healing power of a strong faith, optimism, and a loving and supportive network of family and friends. Hi, Joan. How are you? Terrific. After Joan's presentation, there will be a question, question and answer session. It looks like we've got a great turnout today, so I hope you enjoy. Joan, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I think this is just a terrific topic for, um, for this month, just because I'm thinking of all my um, friends, family um, that, are, um, that have breast cancer, that have been um, diagnosed uh, with breast cancer, have survived breast cancer. Um, and actually, to be honest with you, for all, um, for all people that have had cancer are, are cancer survivors. Um, I certainly know that my experience definitely, um, you know, made me more appreciative of um, diet and lifestyle. And um, I am thrilled to be here with you today to um, be able to share some of the tips that um, I have learned. So anyway, um, let's get started. I want to talk to you about the factors that are going to help reduce your risk of developing cancer. Or if you do have cancer, um, let's see if we can um, if we can nip that in the bud. Because I really feel that diet and lifestyle um, plays a huge role in um, in in making sure that those uh, cancer cells have an environment that they cannot survive in. So let's get started here. OK. The first risk factor for cancer, um, which unfortunately is really a, an issue in the American population today, um, is obesity. And if you're looking at my first slide here, um, a lot of people measure obesity or overweight by, um, by the number on the scale, or they measure it by BMI. But to be honest with you, I find that all too difficult. So what I do, and as you can see my, uh, my dad here in the, um, in the slide, what we do is that we measure waist size. So what I hope for you is that your waist size is less than half of your height. So let's say that um, uh, you are six feet tall. That's 72 inches. You need to have a waist size of less than um, 36 inches. So um, it is very important that your waist size is less than half of your height. The reason for that is, is that belly fat, um, the fat that is carried in the tummy, is a different kind of fat than the fat that's carried in the legs or in the fanny. If you carry your weight in the legs or in the fanny, I don't really care so much. But if you're carrying it around your waist, then I care. Because that kind of fat actually secretes fatty acids. And when the fatty acids are secrete, secreted, then that increases inflammation. And when inflammation is increased inside the body, cancer loves that kind of an environment. So belly fat actually increases inflammation 
And if you happen to produce a cancer cell, which we do periodically produce cancer cells, then that's exactly the environment that that cancer cell likes to live in. So what I want for you is that I want your waist size to be less than half of your height. Um, yeah, I love to observe people. And um, uh, there is a woman in the church that I go to, and she has a very pretty waist and a very flat tummy. But if you look below the waist, her, um, her fanny and her legs are on the bigger side. But to be honest with you, that is not going to affect her health like carrying it around her middle. So um, waist size less than half of your height. Um, now, let's talk about how we're going to get that waist size down to less than half of our height. See, when you start your morning with the wrong kinds of foods, then what happens is, is that you crave the wrong kinds of foods the rest of the day. And actually, you are more hungry and low energy and it's very difficult to um, it's very difficult to think, and it's very difficult to be productive and effective all morning long if you start with the wrong breakfast. The wrong breakfast would be easily digested carbohydrates. And what I want you to look is I want you to look on the side of the screen there. And easily digested carbohydrates is a teeny tiny little molecule. Your body actually is in the business of recognizing molecules. And that molecule is so small that it's really almost already digested. So when that gets down into your stomach, then what happens is your body says, listen, this is no big deal. I have very little work to do. And it goes whoosh. And it throws it into the bloodstream giving you that blood sugar spike. Now, when you get that blood sugar spike from that easily digested carbohydrate, and what might those be? What might be easily digested carbohydrate? How about donuts? How about bagels? How about um, sugary cereals? How about Pop-Tarts? How about um, toaster strudels? Um, croissants. Um, how about pancakes with syrup? How about toast with jelly? All of those are considered easily digested carbohydrate, which is a very small molecule. When that raises that blood sugar so high and so fast, your body gets really nervous. And when your body gets really nervous, the top of that spike, what happens is, is your body will secrete insulin. And insulin's job is to bring down that blood sugar. And when it brings down that blood sugar, it's not going to bring it down nice and slowly. It's going to crash and burn. Because if that blood sugar stays up high for a long period of time, that's diabetes. And diabetes is dangerous because it's high blood sugar or too many sugar molecules in the bloodstream. And when, the sugar when there are too many sugar molecules in the bloodstream, what happens is, is that it destroys the tiniest of the little arteries, the tiniest of the little arteries in the brain, in the eyes, in the heart, in the kidney, and in the toes. And then what happens is, is if blood sugar is um, high for a long time and those arteries are destroyed, let's say you are diabetic, you get a blister on your foot from a new shoe, and that blister gets infected, and it won't heal, and it won't heal, and it won't heal because there's no blood getting to that blister because all of those tiny little arteries are now destroyed. So then eventually, that's, if that blister doesn't heal and it continues to get infected and gets gangrenous, then what happens is, is that we end up you know, amputating that lower extremity. So when you do the wrong thing at breakfast, easily digested carbohydrate, you spike that blood sugar, and you secrete insulin to bring that blood sugar back down. And when your blood sugar comes crashing down after that insulin release, 
then what happens is, right there in the mid-morning, you feel like you've hit a wall. You can't think straight, you have low energy, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I must not have slept very well last night. I, um, I need coffee. That's what I need. I need coffee and I might as well have a little bit of uh, a muffin, maybe a muffin or a bagel or some more easily digested carbohydrate. Because when you start your morning with easily digested carbohydrate, that is what you're going to crave all day long. So mid-morning, I want a muffin. Mid-afternoon, I want cookies, chips, pretzels crackers. I want more easily digested carbohydrate. Unfortunately now, what happens is, is that every time that we spike and crash, we want to spike and crash again because when that blood sugar is on its way up, that feels really good. You're getting a little bit of a sugar rush and you're getting a serotonin release. That's your happy hormone. And when that blood sugar comes crashing down, you want to do that again. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is, is that now you will probably eat twice as many calories in a day as what you really need. And when you eat twice as many calories in a day um, um, as you need, then we're talking weight gain. So we can talk five, seven pounds every year, and before you know it, that abdominal fat or that abdominal girth has grown. So when you start your morning with easily digested um, carbohydrate, then what happens is you want that all day long. Unfortunately, you will be spiking and crashing, spiking and crashing all day, and that, that can happen now five, six times during the day, and every time you do that, you cause inflammation. And inflammation, remember, is where cancer loves to grow. It's like a kid in a candy store. It just loves to grow in that kind of an environment. So when, so now you're causing, every time you spike and crash all day long, you're causing more inflammation, more inflammation, more inflammation. You're also gaining weight because you're increasing your calorie intake during the day. And when that blood sugar comes crashing down like that, I mean, you're really hungry. This isn't your imagination. You're hungry and you're tired and you want more easily digested carbohydrate. So now we've got an, inf an inflammatory environment in your body because we're gaining belly fat and because we're eating the wrong foods and causing inflammation. Cancer loves inflammation. Okay. Um, dietary factors to reduce the risk of developing cancer. Obesity. We need to get that waist size down. How do we get the waist size down? First thing that we do is that we start eating the right food. The second thing that we need to do to reduce obesity is to make sure that we exercise daily. And I'll have people say to me, well, you know, when I was in high school, I was a track star. Well, I don't care what you did when you were in high school. I care what you did yesterday. The benefits of exercise actually only last 24 hours. So what are the benefits of exercise? First of all, it's going to, you're going to burn the calories. You're going to burn extra calories while you're exercising. But that actually is the least of the benefits of exercise. You're also going to raise your metabolism. You're going to use more calories now for the next 24 hours. So if you exercise, let's say this morning or tonight, for the next 24 hours, you're going to use more calories. The next thing that it does is it's going to help your sleep. And if I'm going to get you to lose weight, the deal is, is that I've got to get you to sleep well and for enough time. So enough time for an adult is seven and a half hours of a good quality of sleep. And if I can get you to sleep seven and a half hours with a good quality of sleep, I can get um, the cortisol levels down. And cortisol is caused by stress, and we all have stress in our lives. And it's only reduced by two things. One is exercise, and one is sleep. And if you don't have a good quality of sleep, and if you don't sleep for long enough, then what happens is you wake up in the morning, and your cortisol levels are high. And if your cortisol levels are high in the morning, it says two things to your body. The first thing that it says 
is that I'm hungry. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And the second thing it says to your body is store belly fat. So not only are you eating, eating, eating all day long, you know, I want that. Nope, that wasn't it. No, I want that. Nope, that wasn't it either. No, I want that. Nope, that wasn't it. And you go through the day and you know you're craving something, but nothing seems to satisfy that craving. And you're eating more calories during the day and you're storing it as belly fat. So it's very important that you sleep well for at least seven and a half hours at night. Um, exercise also um, builds muscle mass, and muscle mass uses 50 times more calories than what fat tissue does. So the more muscle I can get you to build, then the more calories that you're going to burn. Also, the more muscle that you build, um, the, uh, the um, longer I'm going to be able to keep you in your own home. What's going to keep you from moving out of your home? I mean, what's going to keep you from staying in your own home? What's going to make you move out of your home? And that could be a fall. And if you have a fall, then what's going to happen is, is that your health now is going to make the decision of where you live. Not You're not going to make the decision where you live. Your health is going to make the decision. So exercise is very important to, um, uh, to help prevent obesity. So eating the right food, getting enough sleep, and exercise. Now, what are the right foods? If that easily digested carbohydrate is the wrong food, what is the right food? The right food is going to be starting your morning with a protein source. Remember that your body is in the business of recognizing molecules. And protein is a gigantic molecule. So when that gets down into the stomach, your body can't put that into the bloodstream to be used as energy. So what happens is it sits in the stomach, sits in the stomach, sits in the stomach um, for a long period of time while your body tears it up with um, gastric juices and, um, and mechanical action until it's small enough that it can be put into the bloodstream. So instead of getting that spike and that crash, what happens is, is that your blood sugar goes up very slowly and then comes down very slowly. So now you're appropriately ready for lunch. And look now, you've missed that whole mid-morning craving, crash, low energy, wanting chocolate in the middle of the morning. So now, when I can get you to start your morning with protein, include a protein source at noon, and include a protein source at night, then what happens is I can keep that blood sugar low and even, I can keep your weight down, and remember, when you spike and crash, you cause inflammation. But when I can keep that blood sugar low and even, then we decrease the inflammation. So I'm cutting the calories, cutting the waist size, and making sure that I cut the inflammation by decreasing the spikes and the crashes. OK. Low vitamin D. OK, where do we get vitamin D? We get vitamin D from the sun. Now, um, who makes vitamin D the best? And that would be lighter-skinned people make vitamin D the best. But unfortunately, lighter-skinned people um, tend to get more sunburns. Well, that's going to be a risk factor for cancer. So lighter-skinned people usually wear sunscreen. Now, or, uh, or actually, most people usually wear sunscreen. But the lighter-skinned people who make the vitamin D when they wear sunscreen or when anyone wears sunscreen, we're not going to make vitamin D in our skin. So um, what we need to do is that we need to make sure, especially um, it, really anywhere on the continental U.S., when we get into the fall, winter, and spring, we need to make sure that we take an oral vitamin D supplement. Vitamin D helps prevent cancer. Um, and the way it helps prevent cancer is I want you to picture in your head um, a bunch of little circles, and those little circles are cells. And when your vitamin D level is high enough, and I really like that level of about um, 45 to 55 um, when you get your vitamin D checked. I like 45 to 55. So picture all these little circles. And when your level is in a normal range, then your cells make vitamin D receptors. And all those little receptors sit on the outside of that cell. So let's say one of those nasty cancer cells shows up on the scene. And he says, 
to those cells with all of those vitamin D receptors. He says, I want you to be a cancer cell. I want to spread to you. And the cells that have all of those vitamin D receptors say, eh, not today. You're not going to spread to me now or ever because I have my vitamin D armor on. I am protected from you because I have enough vitamin D receptors around my cell that you cannot spread to me. Now let's say you have a low vitamin D level. That means that those cells, you only make a couple of little vitamin D receptors on each cell. And that nasty cancer cell shows up on the scene again. And he says to those cells that don't have enough vitamin D protection, he says to those cells, hey, I want you to be a cancer cell. And they say, okay, I guess, I guess we'll let you spread into our tissue. So what happens is, is that those cells are not protected because they don't have enough vitamin D receptors on the outsides of their cells. So what does it take? Well, it takes 20 minutes during, um, uh, during the summertime in Kansas City. It takes uh, 20 minutes of um, sun exposure, let's say sitting in your bikini on the, um, on the front stairs of your house reading the mail. Um, just picture that. Um, so it's 20 minutes of sun exposure with no sunscreen on. But the deal is, is that I don't want you to get a sunburn because a sunburn will put you at risk for melanoma. So if you can't do that for whatever reason, then we need to take a vitamin D supplement. And a vitamin D supplement needs to be 2,000 international units of vitamin D3. That's 2,000 international units of vitamin D3. And our CardioTabs multivitamin already has that in it, so you don't have to take an extra vitamin D supplement. But it is very important, and if you wear sunscreen during the summertime, you probably are going to end up taking, or you're probably going to need to take, a vitamin D supplement all year long. So vitamin D is huge when it comes to um, cancer prevention. And the darker your skin, um, uh, you, if your skin is very dark, you don't make vitamin D as well in your skin. Or if you are overweight or obese, you don't make um, vitamin D as well. So for sure, you need to be on a vitamin D supplement. OK, so um, obesity, inflammation caused by, um, by eating the wrong foods, and low vitamin D. OK, burned or blackened meats. Um, I had a friend who was 38 years old and was diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer. And when he showed up um, at the Mayo Clinic, um, one of the first questions after diagnosis was, do you eat a lot of burned or blackened meat? Burned or blackened meat has been, um, has been found to be a risk factor in GI cancers. In GI cancers would be gastrointestinal. That starts in the mouth, um, goes to the esophagus, um, down to the stomach, the pancreas, the colon, and the anus. So any of those areas are very susceptible to cancer if um, you eat a lot of burned or blackened meats. So let's say um, I go out to a restaurant and I'll order um, the grilled salmon or maybe even the grilled chicken. I never eat um, the part of the grilled uh, the part of the grilled chicken or salmon that has the grill marks on it. I will trim that off. So um, make sure that you don't eat burned or blackened meat because that really will increase your chance of getting GI cancer. Sun exposure, we kind of went over that. Sun exposure, burning, um, if you get sunburns, many sunburns, will really put you at um, a risk for melanoma. And melanoma, pancreatic cancer, those are a couple of cancers that when we when those metastasize, we have a very difficult time curing those cancers. Um, much easier to um, to cure those cancers if they um, if they have not metastasized if they're still contained. 
So, um, so please be very careful of that burned or blackened meat or um, excess sun exposure where you're getting a sunburn. Cigarette smoking, I, it doesn't even seem that I should have to even talk about this, but the reality is, is that um, cigarette smoking is still an issue in the United States. Um, James, my husband, um, the cardiologist, he will, you know, especially like when it comes to heart disease, I mean, we have a, a lot of ammunition against heart disease today. Um, diet, exercise, we have great drugs. But he will tell his, his patients, he'll say, you know, if you're still smoking, I can't help you. So cigarette smoking, of course, um, is, puts you at high risk for many cancers, especially lung. And if you stop smoking cigarettes today, we can start improving your cardiac health this minute this absolute minute we can start improving your cardiac health, but you will still carry that risk of lung cancer for a lifetime. So um, cigarette smoking is a deal breaker. Okay, how um, to help you reduce uh, your chance of developing cancers. Fruits and vegetables are huge. Now when I told you that I wanted you to pick a protein morning, noon, night, that's the first rule of the diet. The second rule of the diet is that I want you to pick two colors. I want you to pick two colors in the morning. I want you to pick two colors at noon. And I want you to pick two colors at night. So what does breakfast look like? Breakfast looks like a protein in two colors. Noon, big surprise, protein in two colors. Night, protein in two colors. Now colors can be fruits or vegetables. Um, so let's say we start our morning with um, uh, let's say um, low-fat or non-fat cottage cheese with a half a cup of strawberries and a half a cup of blueberries. Or maybe um, we do egg whites with um, tomato and green pepper. Now maybe you all are good at that omelet thing, but I can never flip it and and get the uh, and you know get all of the fruits and vegetables in the inside of the omelet. So I end up just basically scrambling my eggs with the fruits and the vegetables um, all together. Um, let's say uh, we do something like um, uh, I call this breakfast in a bucket. In a blender or in the magic bullet, we um, we in the O'Keefe household I think have been through about six magic bullets because. We keep burning out the motor. But in one of those blenders or in the magic bullet, you put in a little bit of skim milk, a uh, scoop of whey protein, W-H-E-Y, which is milk protein. There are two proteins in milk. One is whey and one is casein. And so this is just milk protein that's been dried out of milk. So skim milk, whey protein, and then pick two different colors. Um, during the winter time. I basically keep every kind of frozen fruit that uh, is available in the grocery store in our freezer. So you can do um, peaches and strawberries. You can do strawberries and maybe a half a banana. You can do mixed berries and mango. Um, so a half a cup of two different frozen fruits. Then blend that up. And um, I call that breakfast in a bucket, especially if you're in a hurry. You can drink that at red lights um, on your way to work. So skim milk, whey protein, and two different um, frozen fruits, half a cup of each. Um, so what might lunch look like? Maybe lunch, uh, you have to bring lunch to work. Maybe lunch is a bed of spinach in a Tupperware bowl with um, a chicken breast that you um, maybe something left over from last night. Like, let's say tonight we're going to have um, um, we're going to have pork tenderloin on the grill. I will make extra so that um, so that I have enough for lunch for the next day. But let's say you could have a bed of spinach. You could cut up a red pepper. Those are your two colors, and then put something left over on the top. So maybe the chicken breast or the pork tenderloin, and then. Um, uh, toss that with olive oil and maybe a little lemon juice or olive oil and wine vinegar. So think protein and two colors. When I can get you to get nine servings of protein, I mean nine servings, pardon me, nine servings of color in a day, color is very um, important when it comes to preventing cancer. Not only does it have water, um, vitamins and minerals, 
and um, fiber, but most importantly, it's got antioxidants. And antioxidants I think of as Pac-Man. And when you have a lot of antioxidants in your body, then you have a lot of Pac-Men. And Pac-Men come in and they gobble up all the bad guys. And the bad guys are the free radicals that are causing inflammation. So the more fruits and vegetables you've got in your diet, the more antioxidants you've got, the more antioxidants you've got, the lower your inflammation. And remember that cancer loves inflammation. So the lower your inflammation, the lower um, your cancer risk. So fruits and vegetables are incredibly important. So pick two in the morning, pick two at noon, and pick two at night. Okay. Try colorful berries. Berries are terrific. Um, berries are not only terrific as far as antioxidant behavior goes, but they're also terrific, especially blueberries for your brain. Um, we're, all, we're thinking that uh, blueberries will help prevent dementia and help um, preserve memory. Leafy greens, same thing. Um, we love leafy greens. Leafy greens um, are full of antioxidant behavior and um, we should include some leafy greens every single day. My next favorite, whoops, um, one of my um, other favorite uh, uh, foods for antioxidant behavior is low sodium V8 juice. Now, I know all of you are going, oh, I just don't like that V8 juice, but try it again. Just try it again. Um, make sure that it's nice and cold, pour it over ice, and squeeze a lime in it. And to be honest with you, this is just like drinking your vegetables. Um, it is a terrific, um, it's a terrific beverage. It's great in the middle of the afternoon, really is a thicker um, liquid, fills you up, full of antioxidant behavior, and counts toward your nine servings during the day of fruits and vegetables. So that's a really easy way um, to get some antioxidant behavior um, during the day. Okay, next one, omega-3. Um, everyone should have um, omega-3 in their diet. Now, if you eat um, at least a pound of salmon a week, um, you probably don't need an omega-3 supplement. Um, but if you don't eat that much salmon during the week, um, uh, then you probably do need an omega-3 supplement. And of course, we um, love our um, omega-3 from CardioTabs. We have the extra strength, and then we have um, the we have the enteric coated, which is a little bit smaller. Um, but omega-3 is incredibly important for decreasing inflammation. Um, so it, it is another way that we can um, keep that inflammation low so that cancer does not have an environment that it can grow in. So an omega-3 supplement every single day, if you're not eating a pound of salmon a week, is, um, is imperative. And you have to make sure with your omega-3 supplement that you're getting at least 1,000 milligrams of DHA plus EPA. So very important that you get at least 1,000 milligrams. If you go to, let's say, the health food store or even the grocery store and you look at fish oil supplements, when it says fish oil, let's say 1,200 milligrams of fish oil on the front of the bottle, that means nothing. What you need to do is that you need to turn the bottle around and you need to add up the DHA and the EPA, and that needs to add up to at least 1,000 milligrams a day for decreased inflammation. So remember, it's not fish oil, it's omega-3. Omega-3, 1,000 milligrams a day. Okay, <laughs> now um, I know you're all laughing when you look at this slide. Um, one of my uh, favorite tools, number one for weight loss, um, is Metamucil. Um, I recommend one rounded tablespoon, that's a soup spoon, in at least 16 ounces of water before your biggest meal. So you take a one rounded tablespoon, put it in the glass, fill it up with water, stir and drink. Please do not um, let it sit on the counter because it's going to turn to gelatin. But I want it to turn to gelatin in your stomach. When it turns to gelatin in your stomach, what it's going to do is it's going to fill you up and you will eat less calories at your next meal. 
So if we're working on weight loss, it's a terrific weight loss tool. The other thing that it's great for is that it lowers bad cholesterol, that's your LDL, lowers LDL by anywhere from 7 to 10 percent. I can do that naturally with Metamucil, which is psyllium fiber. And the last thing that it does is that it keeps the colon nice and clean. So if you've ever had any issues with, um, with constipation or, um, or irregularity, um, I love this as a tool. Plus, as I say, as the stool comes through, you can feel that it comes through and it's really nice and clean. So you know that that colon, that the sides of the, the, the colon is staying nice and clean. So it will reduce um, you know, the incidence of um, GI cancers by increasing your fiber. So I love Metamucil. If we're at a Metamucil in the O'Keefe household, then someone's got to go to the drugstore. So, um, and that would be James. Okay, um, exercise. We, uh, we talked about exercise. Exercise is incredi incredibly important, once again, to help you sleep and to decrease, um, uh, in, to increase um, calorie burning, and it also decreases inflammation. Um, one thing that I, let's see, um, the one thing that I did not review that I want to go over very quickly is cruciferous vegetables are incredibly important when it comes to, fat, um, to, uh, to fighting cancers. And what are cruciferous vegetables? That would be Brussels sprouts, um, broccoli, cabbage, um, I'm missing one, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower. Okay, so those four are incredibly important for cancer prevention or if you already have cancer. They actually, cancer just hates those vegetables. They, um, they produce chemicals that make it very difficult for cancer to grow. So if you have cancer, if you'd like to prevent cancer, um, make sure that you, um, you know, have a cruciferous vegetable every single day. Now, I know you're all moaning and groaning when I say Brussels sprouts, but try roasting them. I love this. So what you can do is that you take the Brussels sprout, especially if they're on the larger side, and I just cut, wash them and cut them in quarters, and then I toss them with olive oil, and then I roast them in the oven on a cookie sheet, and then I put foil on the cookie sheet because I hate washing the cookie sheet. Um, and I roast them at 350, but you have to watch them because they will because um, they will brown pretty fast. So um, just try and bake them or roast them in the oven. Um, the other uh, recipe that I really like is um, I will make a vegetable salad with cauliflower, broccoli, um, those little cherry or grape tomatoes, um, onion, um, and mix it with olive oil and wine vinegar. Um, and I will just serve a vegetable salad that looks like that. So um, eating those cruciferous vegetables every single day will help um, prevent cancer and, um, and as I say, make an, a, uh, an environment where cancer is very difficult for it to grow. Anyway, um, in conclusion, in conclusion, let's see. Uh, let's get that waist size down. Let's uh, make sure that your waist size is less than half of your height. The way we do that is we prevent cravings by starting with a protein morning, noon, and night. Make sure that you have plenty of color in your diet. Make sure that you include two colors, morning, noon, and night. Water is incredibly important, um, and it really is six to eight glasses during the day. Physical activity is incredibly important, um, burns calories, reduces inflammation. No smoking. Make sure that you get enough vitamin D and enough omega-3. Anyway, thank you so much for attending today. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Let's see here. Thank you very much, Joan. That was a great presentation with a lot of interesting facts. We've taken some questions. Um, from people as they registered and during the presentation. So we'll go into that while we still have some time left. Uh, first question is, what do you think of Kashi granola bars for breakfast? They're about 140 calories with 7 grams of protein, 5 grams of sugar. Would a bar with an apple or banana be acceptable? Um, you know, I don't love that. First of all, um, um, I want you to look at the ingredient list. Not the nutrition label, but the ingredient list. 
And my rule is, is that if you can't pronounce it, you can't have it. So, or if you don't know what it is, you can't have it. And I know that those Kashi bars basically will, would or could sit on the shelf for years. Um, and, and this because they have so many preservatives in them. And seven grams of protein, to be honest with you, is not a lot of protein. Seven grams of protein is one egg white. So let's say that um, you scrambled up one egg white. That's it, not the yolk, just the egg white. One egg white is about mm, a bite and a half of scrambled eggs. So that is really, number one, that's not enough protein. And number two, I don't like all the preservatives in those bars. Now, um, as I say, you could do breakfast in a bucket. How about my protein pancakes? I love this recipe. Um, in a blender, you blend one cup of non-fat or low-fat, 1% cottage cheese, six egg whites, and one cup of raw oatmeal, just regular old raw oatmeal with the man on the front. Blend that up on a non-stick griddle. Spray it with Pam because these will stick on a non-stick griddle. Um, I usually make about 16, 14 to 16 silver dollar size pancakes. Cook them low and slow because they, um, because they are a protein source and they take a little bit longer to, um, to cook. And then, okay, trick question, do we, uh, do we serve those with honey or syrup or jelly? That would be no. That's that easily digested carbohydrate. We put peanut butter on them. So um, we put protein pancakes. Where are you getting the protein? You're getting the protein from the egg whites, you're getting it from the cottage cheese, and you're getting it from the peanut butter. So that is a terrific, uh, that's a terrific start in the morning. You can make a batch of those and then reheat them um, during the rest of the week. Um, and the serving size is usually about three. In fact, I would give that to Evan O'Keefe, who is now a um, freshman at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, I would give that to him before he would take all his standardized tests, you know, the SAT, ACT, et cetera. So um, I really don't like protein bars. Okay, next question. Great, uh, great response, Joe. Next question is, how many grains per day do you recommend, or do you recommend taking uh, consuming grains at all? Oh, grains? Yes. Oh. You know what? Grains, whole grains are fine foods, but remember good things first. I want you to pick a protein and two colors first. And then whole grains if you're if you um, if you're still hungry. And whole grains are terrific for growing children. Um, they're great for athletes. They're great for people that need more calories. But for people that are really trying to lose weight, I do limit their whole grains because protein, remember, keeps the blood sugar low and even. Keeps you full. Keeps you thinking. Efficient, productive, happy all day long, eating less calories. Fruits and vegetables, antioxidants. Antioxidants morning, noon, and night, helping to prevent cancer. So I think grains, whole grains are fine, but they come after your protein and two colors. Um, the other thing is, is that the best whole grains, I know um, uh, the best whole grains are actually oats and barley. So really not so much wheat, but oats and barley. And if you're going to eat a, a whole grain bread, I really prefer um, the fresh breads, you know, not the kind that are in the Wonder Bread section, but in the kind that actually um, we have a brand in Kansas City called um, Farm to Market, which I just love. And they have one that's called Grains Galore. And that actually you can see the nuts and the seeds in, in the bread. And so if you're going to have a bread or a whole grain bread, make sure that you can see all those nuts and seeds in there. And what that will do is that will slow digestion. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question, what, if any, effect does sugar play in developing cancer? Ooh, yeah. Sugar. Okay, sugar not only plays a role in developing cancer, but it also plays a role in developing wrinkles. Um, sugar causes inflammation. Remember that sugar is a teeny tiny little molecule. Sugar is easily digested carbohydrate. So when you ingest sugar, not only do you want more sugar, not only 
might you gain weight, but every time you have that sugar, you spike that blood sugar, and when you spike that blood sugar, you cause inflammation, and when you cause inflammation, you make an environment that cancer loves to grow in. So the deal is, is that, um, you know, number one, I don't want to do cancer again. That was no fun. And number two, I want to age well. So I don't touch sugar with a 10-foot pole. So I actually do have some girlfriends that um, know exactly how many M&Ms they can eat during the day and maintain their weight, but I can see it in their skin. Their skin has aged terribly. So sugar um, makes an environment that is um, highly inflammatory, and cancer loves to grow in that. So, and inflammation from the sugar also comes out in the skin, causing wrinkles. Thank you for that response. Our last question is, what are the benefits of turmeric? Oh, okay. Um, actually, we, um, uh, we do not have too many human studies on turmeric yet. We have quite a few animal and laboratory studies, but it actually is looking quite promising uh, for cancer prevention. Turmeric is an antioxidant. It's just, um, it, you know, um, and basically comes, it's a spice that comes from India. It is an antioxidant. So once again, um, turmeric has a lot of Pac-Men, and Pac-Men basically um, get in there and gobble up all the bad guys and decrease inflammation. So, and turmeric can be found um, in an everyday food called mustard. So you can, mustard, we consider a free condiment, and so you can use mustard freely and feel that it is really um, um, good for your health, helping you to prevent cancer. I think it's, I think it's going to be very promising. As I say, we don't have a lot of um, human studies yet, but I think it's going to be very promising. We've had one more. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. What are your thoughts on stevia? Ooh. Okay. okay. All right. Here we go. Stevia, along with NutraSweet, um, um, aspartame, all of the non-nutritive sweeteners, um, basically, I don't like them at all. If you came to me and said, Joan, I want to lose weight. And um, and you had artificial sweetener, um, oh, pardon me, non-nutritive sweetener in your diet. Um, you know, I almost can't help you. People that have non-nutritive sweeteners in their diet are resistant to losing weight. And there are three reasons for this. You know, James and I are bantering about this all the time at home. I mean, people say, you know, well, what do you guys talk about? Well, you know, this is what we talk about. So, um, you know, he used to say to me, oh, Joan, you know, just let your let your clients have non-nutritive sweeteners. It's just a little bit of sweet. It's not going to hurt them at all. But I kept saying to him, you know, you don't understand, James. When I, uh, when, when these people have non-nutritive sweeteners in their diet of any kind, they won't lose weight. And so a study came out a few years ago and um, basically said that non-nutritive sweeteners, all non-nutritive sweeteners, whether we consider them coming from a natural source or not, do three things. The first thing that it does is that it turns on your appetite for the day. I mean, it, um, it makes you eat more calories during the day. The second thing that it does is that it turns on your sweet tooth. So you're looking for more sweets during the day. So every cookie tray, every um, candy dish, you know, you want one of those. It turns on your sweet tooth. So increases your calorie intake, um, um, turns on your sweet tooth for the day. And the worst thing is, is that those that have non-nutritive sweeteners in their diet actually have a 40% higher chance of getting the metabolic syndrome than those that don't. And what's the metabolic syndrome? The metabolic syndrome actually is the step before diabetes. So you are knocking on diabetes door the more um, non-nutritive sweeteners you have in your diet. So I don't like non-nutritive sweeteners. I can't, if you need to lose weight, I can't get you to lose weight. And it turns on your sweet tooth, you know, having you hunt for sugar all day long, increasing that inflammation all day long. So people will say, well, how do I get off my, you know, my non-nutritive sweeteners? Well, to be honest with you, what I would do is that I would, um, the lesser of the two evils would actually be sugar. So what I would do is, um, is switch over to a teeny, tiny amount of real sugar and then wean yourself off. So anyway, okay, well, are we uh, complete? Yeah, thank you very much, Joan. A recording of this webinar will be emailed you to in the next couple of days. I want to thank you again for attending Dietary Tips to help reduce your risk of developing cancer webinar. If you have any more questions, you can send them to me directly at a R-A-Z-A-V-I, at cardiotaps.com, 
or info at partytab.com, and we'll make sure uh, to send them for them to Joan get them answered for you. Thank you again for attending, and uh, stay tuned for our next webinar. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks.